Hi again, global friends. Welcome back to Round the World, episode three. Um, I am about to make myself a little something something, uh, but then I will get to calling my friends and friends of friends across the globe uh, to see what they're currently going through. Uh, today's episode, we will be venturing to Japan, then back down to Argentina, and then after that, all the way to Austria in the Alps. So, let's get started. I put a post up on social media telling people I was looking for um, people in specific countries, and I had a huge amount of outreach um, to now sort through, uh, which just shows me how incredible it is that my friends and family have friends and family across the globe that really want to talk during this time. Um, so now I would like to check in with an incredible human being who lives in Japan. Let's see what he has to say. Hello from here in Tokyo, Japan. So there's Mount Fuji over the, over there. Shut up. Zyra, come see Mount Fuji. You can see the white mountain over yeah, there. Yeah, I see it. So here's Tokyo. So or one hi. Tokyo. So cool. Look Hello. Oh, there's wow. Mount Fuji. We uh, are now talking at 10 a.m. your time tomorrow, 4 p.m. my time in Los Angeles, which was a really fun thing to have to figure out while scheduling. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> if you could introduce yourself. So my name is Shiji Miller, and I live in Akashima, Tokyo, Japan. So Akashima is a pre uh, is a city within the prefecture of Tokyo. Um, I am currently a high school math teacher on an American uh, military air base called Yokota Air Base, Japan. And I teach high school mathematics here. Let's talk a little bit about what's currently going on with you know, the quarantine level in Japan during this COVID-19 global pandemic? As of about four days ago, Japan has now been uh, categorized as a level three country, um, which is very restricted movements. Um, but that level was assigned by the American CDC. Um, in terms of quarantine level, is kind of, um, is a weird mix because I have to deal with the quarantine level by the U.S. government assigned by Yokota Air Base because I work for the U.S. government, but also deal with the uh, pandemic situation. The Japanese country was one of the first places to receive the initial COVID-19 cases via the Queen's cruise ship. Um, so when it first started uh, spreading, the Japanese government took a very quick and proactive action, and we quickly shut down m the majority of the, all the schools. And uh, we were put on restriction and high alert, the Japanese government. And at that time, the U.S. government didn't have as much cause to worry yet. As cases rose in the U.S., uh, me working for the U.S. government, our, um, our caution and our worry increased as well as the U.S. worry increased. But then the Japanese government's worry started to decrease because our numbers were starting to plateau instead of exponentially growing like it is currently in the U.S. Um, right now, my thoughts on COVID-19 is that it is very large and significant issue that's affecting the global economy. Something that I once viewed as just the regular seasonal flu that's just going to pass, and it's just people getting sick like people do, is now turned into an economic and social uh, catastrophe. <laughs> and it's affecting everyone globally. What do you think is the most significant way that uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 has affected you in your daily life? My school is personally closed and is now to online virtual learning. So I'm no longer in the classroom seeing my kids face to face like I normally do. I'm teaching virtually. Um, so that's affected my career. Socially, a lot of the businesses, a lot of the um, gatherings and events have also closed or come to a halt. Venturing out. Tokyo on a daily basis, I, uh, the crowds have significantly reduced. There aren't as many people on the train or as many people out on the streets. Um, I had intended to go to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, 
And that is on the verge of possibly being postponed or canceled. My train line that I currently live on is about 30 minutes away from Shinjuku Station. And Shinjuku Station is known worldwide as the busiest and most heavily trafficked train station in the world. Um, It's my main train station that I go to, and it's also the city and the station in which I do most of my social events and social gatherings and meetings. When I normally go into Shinjuku Station, uh, the trains are quite packed, standing room only, and the foot traffic through in and out of the station, it looks like Times Square, New York City, 24-7. As I've gone through Shinjuku Station recently, the crowds have definitely significantly been cut in half. Even Shibuya Crossings, which is one of the, uh, a really well-known intersection, where it's a 16-way intersection and everyone crosses at one time. Even that, when I went through it, the crowds have been cut to maybe like a 16th of what is normal. Wow. And are people in Japan like wearing uh, surgical masks and gloves out in public? Have you have you noticed that? Surgical mask is a interesting topic in Asian cultures, especially in Japan compared to America. Uh, the surgical mask that everyone sees is something that is ingrained in a part of Japanese culture on a regular day to day basis way prior to COVID-19. Um, It is very normal for a Japanese person to wear one of those surgical masks uh, for a variety of reasons. We wear masks because not only do we want to prevent getting sick, we also want to prevent spreading germs to others. Uh, We wear it during allergy season because it filters out a lot of the pollen that we have here. And the surgical masks are also used for fashion and it's also used for uh, in the wintertime to keep our faces warm. So... um, Even before COVID-19, you'll find that the large majority of the Japanese population wear surgical masks year-round, whether it's winter or during spring, during allergy season, uh, for a regular day-to-day basis, uh, regardless of the the COVID-19 case. And so even now, even I would say it was more people wear the surgical mask, but it's really not that surprising because we wear it all the time anyway. What do you personally think the biggest backlash is going to be uh, in in a negative way, obviously, uh, due to coronavirus? Businesses are being greatly affected, and many of my friends have been job searching. This is currently the job hunting season in Japan, and many jobs are not hiring right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, President Trump just, uh, you know, started... uh, you know, talking about uh, calling it China flu or the China virus. I actually worry a lot about the racial tension. I think systemic racism is a huge problem in the U.S. and it's definitely been increasing. Um, There has been a shift in the tension of where the racism is aimed towards and what groups is aimed towards and that there's definitely been a high reported cases of racism against Asian, Asian Americans or Asians abroad in general, not just in America, uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, I think that the political climate that we're in has also played a factor in um, boosting that racial tension. What is one uh, downfall that you've noticed uh, within your community uh, due to the spread of this uh, contagion? Being a teacher, One of the issues that we face is a lot of our students are now being stuck at home. And so a lot of the parents may still have work and they don't have a way to take care of the kids while they are at home doing virtual learning. Or maybe they don't have internet access to be able to do virtual learning so their education is kind of postponed. Or that they are in a negative home environment and they don't want to be home and their only outlet for a positive social interaction is at school and we no longer have that at school to offer. Being a high school teacher, many of my students are feeling the effects of missing out their the prime of their senior year and graduation and sports. And that's a big issue that's being faced personally. Uh, many of my students are having a hard time dealing with that. And it's a really hard thing to deal with, but it's really important for all of us to kind of carry on together and be able to positively move forward, and look ahead for a better uh, experience in the future what is one triumph or something that you're super happy that you saw happening uh during the like spread of this virus 
many of the Japanese people have proven exactly what um, a stereotypical viewpoint of Japanese culture is. They're very unified and they are very um, cohesive in their following the rules and procedures and standards. And because of that, I think that's one of the biggest reasons on why the coronavirus spread is declining here in the U.S. We have a political truck driving by. So what is a political truck? Like somebody with a loudspeaker? They have a loudspeaker on top of their car and they drive around, they campaign. Really? That's so cool. Yeah, we have we have a lot of random things like that. The Japanese culture has done a really good job of being cohesive as a unit and really taking seriously those precautions and kind of displaying to the world that we can actually reduce the impact of COVID-19 by working together as a cohesive unit. Unfortunately, that's not something that I've necessarily seen in the U.S. People still travel and people still get out. And people say, screw it. I'm going to do what I want. It's quite funny because my coworker, who is also Japanese, she and I were talking and we were teaching at the American school. It was really funny to see the divide in the mentality when they told us that our upcoming spring break um, our travel restrictions are very limited and that we're not allowed to travel to certain places or through certain methods like airlines and uh, cruise ships. And the Japanese side of the faculty was very much like, OK, well, that's fine. We're going to stay in our house and we're going to, you know, just take care of things here at home. While the American side of our faculty raised their hand, asking questions on how they can go around these rules, saying, is it OK if I drive there? Is it OK if we go in a group of three instead of group of six? Can I still go there if I already booked my flight? Well, I already paid the money, so I don't care. I'm going to go regardless. The mentality is quite different. That idea that we somehow have superpowers and can block, like, kung fu style, I guess, like, anything that comes our way, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. That's something that we can learn as Americans. We are not invincible. And if a large grouping of all of our government is saying that it's important to stay home, probably don't go to spring break on the beach and spread the virus really requiring people to reflect upon their life and what they do at home and to, you know, pick up a hobby and do new things or to improve upon things that they've already done or to catch up on work or to how to handle isolation or how to handle these kinds of situations. And I think it's forcing people to grow. Do you think that you would be able to or want to, like, say a message in Japanese to Japan slash the world? What that actually just means is like, everyone, please take care and um, let's do this together. We can do this. I just thank you so much for taking the time and for getting on here and saying what you have to say about this COVID-19 spread. Thank you so much for having me. And I really enjoy talking to you about the current and, you know, your interest in seeing what's going on on the other parts of the world. Um, I decided I wanted to give a call to one of Mercedes' friends. Uh, You met Mercedes back in episode 102, uh, and she has a friend named Annie, who she said I had to speak to. Uh, She's currently also living in Argentina, but uh, is originally from Switzerland. So I wanted to give a call to someone who is pretty far from home uh, to see what they're going through in a country that is not uh, their home country. So let's give her a call. My name is Annie Dutois. I'm a, a, an actress and I am currently in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Originally, I'm from Switzerland. Uh, I, I grew up in, in Geneva, um, but I come from a performing artist family, so always traveling quite a lot. I, I left Switzerland uh, to go to college in the U.S. I, I did my undergrad, uh, my graduate school there, a Ph.D. I, I was even a professor for a while um, at Arizona State University. Um, and I, I was uh, teaching uh, French literature, comparative and French literature. And then I, I, I sort of switched to the performing arts, you know, going back to my roots. <laughs> 
bring literature to the stage in a way, like sort of, it's not completely off, but it was more, um, you know, a desire of mine to be, you know, doing something that would have a broader impact probably. And how, well, how do I end up in Argentina? My mother's from Argentina and sorry, my son is here. Um, my mother's from Argentina. And um, so I, 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 I wanted to spend some time here and I, I started you know, connecting with, with the local um, art scene and one thing led to the other. And then I got, uh, you know, cast for this play. We had been rehearsing for about two and a half months, really, when we had to stop. Uh, so, you know, all the costumes are, are made, the stage design, everything is, I mean, we, we had like two weeks to go before the, the premiere. So basically now it's been suspended, but I mean, postponed because of the situation. We have no idea when theaters will open again. So they're thinking about doing streaming, you know? Yeah, I think it's very interesting how uh, businesses are taking to technology in order to like, you know, make sure that things don't stop because it is very difficult, especially when you work in a field where you need people to be there. I mean, you have to have an audience or... Right. <laughs> or it's a beautiful play that no one gets to see. Yeah, let's hope it works. Uh, it's it's a real crisis. I mean, I come from a performing artist family, you know. My parents are classical musicians and everything has been canceled. I mean, they have zero concerts in perspective for the next six months or something, you know. like So everything is really, I think for, for performing artists, it's really rough. Art altogether is something that we have cultivated so well as a society. And we need to make sure during this, you know, COVID pandemic that we're paying attention to those people that do give us that art. So thank you for saying that. My youngest son is uh, was going to school in Arizona, living with his dad while I'm here. And he came to see me for spring break and got stuck here. No so way. I'm actually, yes. <laughs> So he's here with me, uh, you know, which I'm very, very happy about because I don't think I would actually be able to um, go through this without him. I, you know, it's it's a blessing. It was amazing because he arrived exactly at the right moment in a way, because had he arrived one week earlier, probably he would have gone back. And one week later, he wouldn't have been able to travel. They actually canceled all flights a few days after he arrived, and we didn't know it was going to happen, obviously. And then they closed all the um, the country off. So basically, he's here with me and doing school <laughs> from wow. Zoom. I mean, like all his friends, really. So that doesn't change much. But I'm really grateful that he's with me, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> so. I am too. I'm so glad. I mean, there are so many people around the world right now who don't have anyone with them while they're self-quarantined. I'm personally, like, worried about those people. It's totally different to talk to somebody via... a uh, computer and a screen yeah. than it is to be able to talk to them in, in real time and, and have them in your same space. And so I think it's such a, like you said, a blessing that he's there. And I'm very happy to hear that. But the strange thing is because his school is in Arizona and we're in Argentina, we have to change our schedule. So basically we go to bed at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> we have totally strange schedule and we wake up at noon. What were your thoughts uh, on COVID-19 uh, when it first started? Well, you know, I have, I was, aware of the coronavirus pretty early on because um, I was actually supposed to go to China in, in January, which thank God I didn't for a different project uh, before coming to Argentina. And uh, my, my, you know, my parents also uh, had uh, concerts in Asia. So we knew from very early point that this was a real problem because they started canceling everything in China. Uh, we're in contact with people there in Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, there was the idea that this would not come here, you know. Uh, now, when it hit Europe, Argentina was still okay. Uh, then that's when people started becoming worried. This is my son. Hi. Yes, he can come in. Can Hi. he come in? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> Hi. In Argentina has a lot of people uh, from Italy and Spain also. So a lot of people were coming back from these countries. And this is how the virus got in here, obviously. Uh, but they reacted very fast here. I was pretty impressed, I have to say. Because, you know, they there, there weren't that many cases, but they immediately implemented. Um, first of all, they canceled all flights. They, they closed the borders. And then now the quarantine. Uh, the, the sort of, was, you know, and they're pretty strict about it. It's not optional at all. 
And, and of course, our kids are dealing with other problems. I mean, this is a develop in a way, they have a lot of poverty. They have a lot of poverty here, a lot of people living in terrible conditions. They don't even have running water, you know, and there's a whole social issue. So it's been very interesting to follow that here and to see how, you know, they're, they're doing a pretty good job, I have to say. We're not going to live in a normal way for a while. That's what I think. I think that we are going to be forced until they find actually a vaccine or uh, prophylactic measures. We're going to be forced to, you know, change our ways of living. Obviously, we cannot stay in the situation we're in right now, which is this super strict. I think the social distancing is going to be something that's going to be part of our lives in a way or another for a while. And I see it maybe as an opportunity. I, uh, you know, thinking about our lives and how we're living and how, you know, we should change certain things. What are the things that we value really, you know? We are coming together as a species. We're all homo sapiens now, you know? It doesn't matter what color, what gender, what political leaning, whatever. It's really an opportunity to see what brings us together. We're a species, we have to fight something together, you know? And that's something quite beautiful. It's, when did this happen last? I mean, seriously, I, I don't know. So maybe this is uh, something that could be good. I, I hope that people truly take this inside of themselves and really start to question the way they treat others, the way they see themselves at, like within the structure of the world, so that that way, whenever the change does happen, because it's going to, and like there's going to be a giant wave of goodwill, I just hope that that wave keeps coming. When this first started, the quarantine, I was uh, you know, going up and down the stairs uh, of the building to, to get a bit of exercise. And I went up two stories and I saw on one of the doors a sign, which was terrible. It was like sort of xenophobic. It was like foreigners don't enter or stop. You also have to do quarantine. Otherwise, we will denounce you to the police or something like that. I was furious. I know this is an issue. Like, I know there have been a lot of, you know, racism towards Asians. Uh, and, you know, and I felt concerned for myself to tell you the truth. To speak French in Argentina, to have a French accent is considered kind of cool, you know, <laughs> but now it's not. At some point, my parent, my father called me from Switzerland and we speak French. And I said, you know, I can't speak right now. Like I was in a supermarket. I was like, I'm not feeling comfortable speaking French to you because I feel that people are going to be hostile. And I know it's happened everywhere. I mean, I have some, you know, Asian friends who are feeling the same thing in Europe. I mean, you know, it's just like there's a kind of feeling of fear of the other so that's that's the other that's the real and i and, and i experience it too you know <laughs> so yeah as as a as being a foreigner yeah i think that xenophobia and you know the way that people are blaming a specific grouping of people for this um you know i think that this was a governmental breakdown this was a communication breakdown between governments i mean the fact that a government is even allowed to have a, a pandemic happen without letting other people know is kind of to me like chernobyl that should be something that every single government is required by law to let other people know so that they can take measures um yeah. so that it doesn't get to this point but you know hindsight is 2020 we've already had situations like this in history and we're proving again that we just don't listen um uh, what what is one good thing that you've noticed during this time or triumph time is the most precious thing we have you know we and and we live in a society that 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 basically we have no time to do anything all the, you know, we're constantly busy, busy, busy. So suddenly now we're forced to have time and we're forced to, to get bored. Supposedly. I, I, I don't think boredom is a bad thing. I think it forces you to face things that you don't want to face otherwise, you know, because you don't want to, <laughs> so you kind of escape during other things. So this forced um, time that we have is, is, at least for me, I think is is forcing me to to face certain things, to to reevaluate certain things, and also to be in touch with people that uh, you know I love. That basically I didn't take the time, or they didn't take the time to to talk. Uh, and is there anything specific that you would like to say in one of the many languages that you speak? Spanish, French you know, English. Well, we'll get to the English second, but uh, with one of your native tongues uh, to the world or also Argentina, just kind of telling them what you think about what we're currently going through. Je voudrais dire euh, à toutes les personnes qui parlent français dans le monde que nous sommes 
tous dans cette situation et quelque part, nous sommes réunis. Nous sommes seuls, mais nous sommes ensemble. Et ça, vous le savez déjà. Mais je pense que c'est une opportunité pour nous de, de nous rendre compte que nous sommes euh, tous des homo sapiens. <rire> voilà. Je le dis en français, mais on pourrait le dire en... C'est dommage qu'il n'y ait pas une langue universelle pour, pour, pour nous réunir, mais enfin, on fait ce qu'on peut. <laughs> My hope is that the situation we're in will bring us together, is bringing us together as a species. And I think it's important for us to realize that we are a species, we are one. And in front of, of a crisis like this, it doesn't matter whether you have a lot of money, you have no money, whether you're, you know, straight, gay, white, black, whatever. Uh, woman, I, I think it's wonderful in a way to feel that we are one. And I hope that after this, we'll be able to, to be more aware of, of the fewer differences that we have rather than always trying to show the differences between us, whether it's gender difference or whatever, to, to see that we are actually very similar, all of us, you know. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to, to live more in harmony. I mean, I'm an idealist, but I think that this is the moment to think about that and, and not to think about differences and discrimination. Also, I think that whatever happens in one country, it may be that the United States uh, or Europe is able to control this virus. But if we cannot control this in Africa, in Latin America and other countries, it doesn't matter whether you control it in one country. Now we have to work all together on this you know, and help each other. So this is for me an opportunity, again, to bring us together and, and, and you know, forget about this kind of nationalistic and, and identity kind of uh, leaning politics. You know, I really think it's, it's a moment to reevaluate this. So let's do it together. We are running out of time, Annie. I cannot thank you enough for getting on with me. I'm so glad that Mercedes put us together. Uh, you know, you're kind of, far away from where you consider home right now. And so I want you to know if you want to just call me on Skype at any point in time to chat. I know you're busy with your friends and family, uh, but I am available. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but I will let you get back to your day and Raphael's day. Um, thank you again so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Ciao. Hi again, everyone. So... You have seen a lot of people around the world. Um, I now wanted to contact one of my favorite people in the entire world, Sylvia Ebner. Um, she is a published author and a full-time school teacher in Lienz, Austria. Um, she happens to be my partner's cousin, uh, which is how I know her. Uh, and the first time I met her, I cried afterwards because she's such an incredible human being. Let's check in with Sylvia and see how things are going in Austria. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I'm Sylvia Ebner from Lienz, and Lienz is a really small town in East Tyrol, uh, in Austria, for the ones who wouldn't know. And we are about 40 kilometers away from the Italian border, right in the Dolomites. So in an absolutely beautiful area. So you just went on a walk, right? I did. We are allowed a small walk um, per day. Not really, not really a hike, not really sports, but we can go outside, which is good. Even though the world is in kind of a crazy place, it's still revolving. It's still turning. It's still evolving. It is. It is actually working. We have been inside our homes and flats and houses now for 10 days and um, life goes on. I'm a teacher, so I spend my mornings correcting papers that my students send. I am an author, <laughs> you want to have written a book, and uh, I'm also working as a journalist um, if I find the time to, which right now I can. Um, I love to uh, tell stories. So in our situation at the moment, I have started telling stories on Facebook and um, I've got really nice feedback. So yesterday, um, a mother of two asked me if I had, um, if I could tell her stories in the evening because she's too tired. 
to hold a book. And um, so she gave me her telephone number. And what I'm doing today is I'm going to tell her a story or read a story to her on her WhatsApp um, voice box. What I do see now is that people start reading books again. They love to listen to stories. Um, they they appreciate if somebody, you know, puts something online. It shows that uh, it's quite hard to be inside all the time, not being able to go to work and uh, having to spend the whole day, yeah, on your own sometimes. There's so many artists right now uh, who are banding together with the technology that we currently have to do free concerts. And it's just so beautiful to see uh, human beings truly just working together to make sure that no one feels alone. People get closer to each other, even if they are separated from each other. Very bizarre situation, but it it is the case, yeah. What is the level of quarantine uh, where you are in Lyons? Right now, the quarantine level in my area, in the Tyrol, is um, severe. Uh, we are not allowed to leave our town, our village, except for really, really urgent needs, like going to a doctor if there is no doctor in your village. When COVID-19 started to spread, I thought um, that it was out of proportion, um, out of proportion regarding uh, the media coverage or out of proportion regarding the worries. Because for me, the numbers didn't speak for such a huge amount of hysteria. And comparing the numbers to people to the numbers of people dying from hunger, from AIDS, from malaria, uh, even from um, the people drowning in the Mediterranean seas uh, in these last years. Nothing really spoke for this kind of uh, anxiety and fear and hysteria. And so I was, I was really wondering what was behind all that. Why would all of a sudden something that resembled a bit the flu and um, that apparently was only really a risk for elderly people and people suffering from severe diseases anyway, would make everybody uh, so um, incredibly worried that things were all of a sudden possible that nobody would ever have thought possible to be possible, like government shutting down the economy and... Um, politics turning entirely around this only topic. So I was just um, very much surprised, really. I, I, I still am. I still am. What do you think caused, uh, like from your opinion, um, this mass hysteria that is surrounding this specific disease? I do understand all the worries about our hospitals um, getting too many patients because obviously our hospitals are already full, uh, let's say, with people suffering from normal diseases. And they would not have um, the beds, the doctors, um, the medical resources for hundreds and, or even thousands of more patients. So I can understand that. And I can also understand that um, nobody wants a virus in a hospital because people there uh, are so fragile already. So a virus inside a hospital um, contaminating all these patients is obviously um, a huge, huge risk. Um, so I can understand that. I can still not entirely understand um, why the measures are so dramatic. Because obviously protecting our elderly, obviously protecting people suffering from diseases uh, makes total sense. Locking everybody away 
and not, um, you know, trusting their common sense to stay away from each other, to keep the distance. Yeah, well, that's that's really dramatic. And um, we will have to see um, if it's really necessary. Hopefully we will find out that it's not, because if it is, um, then it's, um, yeah, then our world is really facing something so huge that the outcomes, uh, yeah, are still to be seen. What would you say is the, uh, like, most important way that COVID-19 has affected you personally? Well, personally, this coronavirus has made us all, and not just me, think a lot more about our present and future situation. So obviously the positive aspects so far that nature gets um, a break and seems to recover um, more quickly than we could ever have dreamt. I am worried. I'm definitely worried about people losing their jobs and um, businesses um, losing their clients and therefore going bankrupt. I'm worried about the financial crisis that will affect hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Um, but at the same moment, uh, we are all reconsidering globalization. We are all reconsidering uh, what or how valuable our um, local infrastructure is and how much we depend on it. So there are downsides, but there are also positive aspects of this coronavirus situation. Yeah, I'm also quite worried about um, people being left alone a bit in their homes at the moment with a situation we are normally not used to deal with. So I'm quite worried about aggression, about fights, about drug abuse and alcoholism and severe personal problems, all locked away uh, in flats and homes and uh, people not being able to get away from it. You know, being a teacher, I am always worried about kids that might not be treated well. And um, some, a lot of kids actually um, do need some space outside of their homes because home is not safe for them. So a lot of kids need their schools and their kindergarten or um, even just other people taking care of them when their parents are sometimes just too stressed to do it well. So I am worried about people being left alone with personal problems and hopefully, hopefully um, the politics will take care of that and will um, provide help in case people need it and I'm sure they do. Have we ever faced something like that? Economies are closing down worldwide. I mean, looking at these empty streets in LA, in, um, in, in, in Moscow, in uh, Islamabad, wherever, all over the world. And, and the impact this will have on our economy, I mean, is, is unimaginable for me. And the economic crisis will definitely, definitely hit all the small people out there. So um, my worries are against for those who are so vulnerable, you know. And I really, really hope that all the governments worldwide see that because it cannot be a survival of the fittest. I mean, if that is the case, we are really... Um, not proving to have evolved very far because we are only as strong as our weakest, you know, member. And if we um, do not take care of them, um, yeah, it's we can proud. We cannot be proud of ourselves and how far we have got. 
can you say something in German to your local population? Uh, um dieses Interview jetzt auf Deutsch zu beenden, ich glaube, dass die Corona-Krise wirklich eine Chance sein kann. Aber wir müssen etwas dafür tun. Also wir müssen diese, diese Chance sehr ernst nehmen und äh, in unseren Familien darauf achten, dass, dass äh, wir mit unseren Emotionen wie Frust und Aggression und äh, Angst und so weiter gut umgehen lernen, um einfach auf unsere Nächsten zu schauen und um dann äh, unsere Solidarität auszuweiten auf all jene, die nicht nur in unserer kleinen Umgebung bei uns sind, sondern die es ähm, äh, noch viel mehr brauchen dort draußen, die in Flüchtlingslagern unsere Solidarität brauchen, die äh, in den Straßen großer Städte in, ähm, äh, in Gebieten völliger Armut äh, diese Solidarität brauchen. Ja, yeah, so I just said that I really hope that our solidarity reaches all the people out there and not just our beloved ones. Um, but in order to be able to do that, we really have to um, strengthen ourselves and work with our emotions in our tiny little microcosm so that once this is stable, uh, we can reach out to all the others. And yeah, the chance is there. So let's just take it really. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you so much, Sylvia, uh, for taking the time to, um, you know, come on here and chat with me. The fact that we have this technology is incredible. Um, I really, really appreciate you. Thanks so much for uh, getting in touch. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you're doing because it's, again, some way of connecting people. And that's all we can do at the moment. And it's fantastic that it works. We do appreciate so many people now you know the ones cleaning the streets and uh, the ones working in the hospitals the ones are still there in all our grocery shops being so friendly every time i go in there so um i think we really learn to appreciate people and um things that we took for granted a lot more and That's also beautiful. So I will appreciate it so much to see you again, <laughs> to visit you again and to hug you again. But really, we have to finish because otherwise we will be talking forever. I know. <laughs> so, so okay. just say bye and then I'll stop. Bye. Before. Now really a final goodbye from Austria. It's getting dark. Can you see it? Well, looks like that's going to do it for episode 103 of Round the World. Thanks so much again to all of our guests and also to all of you who are currently watching. It means a lot to me. Um, I hope it also means a lot for you. I decided to name this episode Xenophilia because it is the opposite of xenophobia. Uh, we are getting the chance right now with this vidcast to go into the homes of people across the globe. Um, and I just want to show and hope everyone gets the sense that we have far more things that make us similar than dissimilar. So give it some thought. <laughs> also, uh, I wanted to ask you guys all to subscribe. It's on one of these sides. My editor is way cooler than I am. I don't know which side it's on. Uh, and I also wanted to say a big thank you to our certified deaf interpreter. So thanks so much everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time.